When I was younger, I used to love to go backpacking and just think about things. I'd always get this amazing sense of complete independence and then utter dependency because actually it was all that gear that made it possible to say nothing of my car. No other species needed a propane stove or a flashlight or a tent. Sometimes I would wonder, do I even belong here? I mean, after all, I'd be driving home pretty soon. But there I was, so I must belong. The deer, the bears, the insects, they all fulfilled an ecological function. But what about me? What about us? I sometimes would find myself with this really unsettling question. What are people for? In terms of the basic ecological functioning of the earth, what are people for? I definitely don't have the answer to that question, and I'm not sure there is one, but my research on global environmental politics over the years has given me a different spin on it. I want to suggest to you that powerful forces are pressing us to become planetary, both in our social and political institutions and in our consciousness. Let me tell you, we've basically become, as a species, a geological force. In the blink of an eye, geologically speaking, we have bumped our home planet from the Holocene, whoops, <laughs> the interglacial sweet spot in which human civilization emerged into entirely new conditions. That's the meaning of the term Anthropocene the name that scientists have given the new geological epoch that we've unleashed. In other words, we're operating outside the planetary boundaries of the Holocene that gave birth to civilization. That's, we know about climate change and the carbon cycle, but it's also true for Earth's great nitrogen and phosphorus cycles and the basic functioning of the entire biosphere. We're kind of out of bounds. <laughs> and then there's things that aren't even on this slide, like plastic particles and nuclear radiation in ecosystems everywhere. So we're fundamentally changing the planet. And while political dysfunction and polarization dominate the news, we've actually attained an ironic unity as a geological force. So maybe it's time that we wake up. I want to make a couple of things clear at the outset. First, we are not all equally to blame. The everyday lifestyles of a few of us are actually much greater drivers than mo those of most of us. But our most affluent, the, our lower functioning members are quickly adopting the lifestyles of the affluent. And why shouldn't they? So planetary politics means taking global justice seriously and finding ways of living that can work globally for the long haul. Second, whoops, second, nothing is inevitable. While planetary pressures are upon us, an ultimately planetary politics is going to have to be a matter of collective choice, especially if we want it to be democratic. Lest we think of planetary politics as something abstract and utopian, let's look at some foundation stones that are already in place. So here's a NASA image of the Earth from space and you see the atmosphere, the layers, you can actually see the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere. Our planet's atmosphere is a lot like a cell's membrane. It protects us from, and not just us, the entire biosphere, it protects us from asteroids, harmful radiation. So we don't just live on Earth. We actually live inside the Earth system. Oops. 
I wrote my first book on the Montreal Protocol on Stratospheric Ozone Depletion. And without those treaties negotiated over 30 years ago under the Reagan administration, imagine that, and uh, we probably wouldn't have the luxury to be thinking so much about climate change today. So for 30 years, whole families of ozone-depleting chemicals have been basically outlawed and replaced with safer substitutes. For over three decades now, a strong confluence of scientific research, intergovernmental cooperation, and technological innovation has been saving the ozone layer. And hardly anybody knows about it. For climate change, the Paris Agreement's objective of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius actually sets a planetary threshold. But as you might know, the Trump administration announces withdrawal from that treaty. However, the rest of the world went forward. And the US kind of sent its own delegation to the last talks. Mayors, governors, businesses from the US stepped up to the plate. Other treaties establish planetary protections for the oceans, for Antarctica, for the use of outer space for whales, so we do have some planetary protections in, space, in, in place. In the social arena, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights and a host of other treaties have gone far to establish basic principles of universal human dignity. So, yes, we have far to go, but some basic foundation stones are definitely in place. We might think of planetary politics as all coming from the top down, international law, but you can also see it bubbling up from the grassroots. I wrote my last book on eco-villages, quite different from stratospheric ozone depletion, but both instances of planetary politics, I would say. And basically, these are communities at the leading edge of sustainable living, and the most amazing thing to me, actually, I found it out early on, is that they've sprung up independently all over the world, in rich and poor countries, in religious and secular cultures, in cities and rural areas, and they're basically trying to find sustainable ways of living that can work globally. You can also see this kind of planetary politics in the global food justice movement, and other locally based, globally linked initiatives that are literally bringing people and planet together. Finally, I want to bring some of these ideas home into our lived experience. I like to do this with my students to help them integrate what can be potentially overwhelming information into their real lives and then integrate their insights into group action projects and take it out into the world. For instance, one group got curious about the implications of this NASA image and they partnered with the Seattle Astronomy Society and held a public event called Losing the Night. I never would have thought of it myself. So through contemplative practices, we can actually learn to know what we feel, feel what we know, and act accordingly. And it turns out that our bodies are ideally suited to this task. So I invite you now to bring your attention to your internal experience, which usually means closing the eyes. And just notice your weight on the chair. And notice that this is actually a consequence of gravity. And that gravity is a relationship between your body and the body of the Earth. 
It's a relationship that's with you from the moment of birth to the moment of death. And in a way, it makes all other relationships possible. And now bring your attention to your breath. And savor it. Every molecule that you inhale has been circulated through countless beings over the course of eons. And you might want to take a deeper breath and let it out real slow and just savor it. And just wait until the next breath comes of its own accord because it just does that. So breath, it's an automatic connection to the thin blue line that protects us all, the atmosphere. It's a give and take, a constant interchange with the entire biosphere. And it's with us all the time like gravity. So gravity and breath, they're kind of like coming home. And into this quiet space, recall that you're living at the dawn of the Anthropocene. And ask yourself, who am I at this hinge moment in time? What's my contribution? What's my gift? You might imagine yourself coming together with others and asking yourselves, what's our contribution? And when you're ready, gather the harvest of this mini contemplation and come back. So I can't pretend to have answered my big question, what are people for? Otto Leopold asked us to think like a mountain, but I actually believe the Anthropocene calls us to think like a planet. A viable global civilization will only be possible if we can somehow learn to function as the collective mind of the Earth's system. We actually are the Earth becoming conscious of itself. We're an unusual species. <laughs> we'll most likely make it. We're an exceptionally brainy and weedy species. The question is, what kind of species will we be? not whether we will make it as a species. What kind of species will we be? And ultimately, that's a question of consciousness translated into politics. Thank you.